Hi, Professor John Brett. Nakikita niya kaya ako. Sino pa lang dito? May delayed, may delayed reaction dito. So, pag mag-set up ako dyan, then mamaya.
Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. We'll wait a bit because some students are transitioning to join us uh, from their classes. So I hope you don't mind. Uh, let's give it uh, five more minutes before we can start so that our students and other participants can join us. Thank you. Let's test uh, your connection, Carmen. Good afternoon, Tudin. Okay, yeah, I think we can hear you. Can you see me, Paul? Yes, you're all okay. good. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, let's just check on that. And Kili, maybe Thank you, you can also the uh, recorded videos. Uh, if that works, so that we just want to ensure that it won't delay us at when we start Mama. So we can start with Marinelle first, then Jeff.
All right, I think we can start. All right, we can ask Kili. Okay. So good afternoon, everyone. Let's check with our Good afternoon once again, and welcome to our afternoon session for the 114th Bangu Charter Day uh, Anniversary Lectures. I'm Leia Abayal, uh, a Professor of History and current Dean of the College of Social Sciences. And um, for those of you who were not able to join us this morning, um, we're very happy to have you for this afternoon session. Those joining from this morning and uh, this afternoon as well, welcome back. And for this afternoon, we're uh, presenting to you two panels. Um, uh, the first panel is on uh, uh, history of Baguio. And uh, we're happy to have uh, two presentations um, on uh, Baguio marriage history by Marinelle Bendicion and um, another presentation from um, uh, Jeff uh, Paran on the forgotten Ibaloy uh, plan of Kabag uh, Kafagwai. So that's for the for, uh, that second panel um, this afternoon. And the third panel for this lecture series uh, will be on biodiversity in Baguio. So we'll hear more about Buyog watershed, uh, which is actually in Baguio. I don't know all the, also this. Um, I, I just found out about this recently from a Professor Zeni Bawanan. And uh, joining us as guests for the third panel is Linda Pawid, um, who will join um, Prof. Zeni on uh, the biodiversity program. So that's uh, two panels for this afternoon. And thank you for joining us. Um, welcome back, students. Thank you. Uh, I know that you just transitioned from your class to this. And our moderator for this after for this for the second panel will be uh, Carmen Yangot from um, the Department of Anthropology, Sociology, and uh, Psychology. Um, she's our uh, teaching fellow for the PhD Indigenous Studies program. So on to you, Carmen. Thank you. Thank you, Dean. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome once again to the 114th Baguio Charter Day Lecture Series. So as noted, you listened to the earlier panel today on uh, Baguio as a UNESCO creative city and then the economic empowerment of women. Now this afternoon, we have two lectures from um, products of the UP Baguio Bachelor of Arts and the Social Sciences Program, and their topics have something to do with uh, family, from marriage to migration to memory. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce the first speaker. We have um, Marinelle Bendichon, who had completed her social science degree, major in history and minor in psychology. And her thesis in 2022 won the best thesis for um, student submissions. Now she is working as uh, an assistant of operations and marketing to a Filipino jewelry company and a skincare brand based in Canada and the UK. So let's have the lecture of Marinelle. Ladies and gentlemen, let's start with a simple truth. Numbers, more often than not, tend to make historians squeam in their seats. They are like the historian's pet peeve, lurking in the background, casting doubt on our storytelling prowess. In the grand landscape of social sciences, we're often told that numbers don't quite fit within the realm of history, except, of course, when it comes to economic history. Historians were stereotyped as those who cringe at the sight of a spreadsheet or a graph. But today, we aim to change that narrative, 
Madeline Worker of the American Historical Association reminds us that historians don't need to be mathematical wizards to be quantitatively literate. In fact, we can embrace numbers as our allies and tools that help us uncover the hidden stories of our past. So together, let's take a brief journey into the history of Baguio City from 1903 to 2015. With numbers as the central historical subject weaving through our historical continuum. Hi, I'm Marino. A graduate of Bachelor of Social Sciences with a major in history and minor in psychology. It is an honor to be here today presenting on the topic, Nuptiality in Transition, a look at Baguio City's marriage history. Historical demography, particularly in the Philippines, has been rel relatively underexplored, but it is not devoid of studies. We draw inspiration from scholars like Peter Sinas and Daniel Dopper, the editors of Population and History, the Demographic Origins of Modern Philippines. They emphasized the significance of conducting localized demographic studies and examining them from a long-term perspective to reveal broader national demographic pattern. They also highlighted the existence of wealth of primary records that remain available but largely untapped. However, when we consider population as a historical subject, it encompasses four processes, fertility, mortality, mutuality, and migration. Among these processes, Nuptiality appears to be understudied in the Philippine population history. Existing literature has often associated nuptiality with fertility, but scholars argue that we should study nuptiality as a distinct topic. As Francis Giologo argued in his chapter on population in history titled Demography and Autonomous of Filipino History, marriage, household, and nuptiality patterns are subjects that have never escaped the interests of sociologists. However, sociologists often study contemporary society and employ little historical analysis. There is a need for demographic historians to contribute to the study of such topics. E. Van de Waal in 1993 once challenged the academic field to care about marriage patterns in their own right, because understanding changes in nuptiality could foster comprehension of other social changes, particularly changes in nuptiality patterns especially those of females, reflect the transformations occurring in a place or a city. In examining the nuptiality patterns of Baguio City, I relied on a combination of valuable data sources. These included 12 out of 14 national censuses, the local registry records, thank you so much, uh, local Registry Officer Bernardina Tabin for accommodating my research requests during those period. And the Family Search website, which is a nonprofit organization and website operated by the Genealogical Society of Utah, which has meticulously digitized genealogical records from the Philippines. Regrettably, I was unable to access parish sources, a resource I had hoped to utilize. Due to pandemic-related constraints, 
I turn to digital repositories of archival collections available on the internet, which provided a lifeline for my research. This screenshot shows how the marriage records from the Philippines are presented from or on the Family Search, the website run by the Genealogical Society of Utah, and it shows the location, the age, and the date of birth for both the, the female and the male, the bride and the groom. Also, as part of the study, I also conducted an assessment of the reliability of census data, although I won't. I won't delve into those details today. To comprehend changes in female neutrality patterns, I needed to analyze both the prevalence and timing of marriage. This involved examining the proportions of women within the population who were married or unmarried, shedding light on whether marriage was common or universal among women. Equally significant was determining the age at which women typically married. Age played a pivotal role in defining the structure of marital trends. Did they tend to marry early or later? Our exploration of Baguio City's marital history was quantified through key metrics, including the female cingulate mean age at marriage, this is the estimated mean age of marriage using the number of unmarried female or women in the population. The Coles Index of Proportions Married, which indicates that a value below 0 0.6 means that the female population is marrying at a later age. Proportion of females never married by age group and proportion of females married by age group. Before the 20th century, the Ibalois of Cafebue practiced early marriage as evident in their traditions of Calon and Kaisi, where parents arranged marriages for their children. For the pre-war period, or for the 20th century Baguio City, I divided the period into two segments the 1903 to 1939, 1945 to 1999, and the 21st century, 2000 to 2015. The censuses from 1903 to 1918 lacked detailed information on marriage timing, including Ipaloi marriage practices. These censuses only demonstrated the prevalence of marriage among female population with a 49% of women married or widowed in 1903 and 65% in 1918. Data extracted from family search comprising 273 marriage records indicated that most women were married at the age of 18. There are 64 women who got married at the age of 18. And the mean age at marriage with these ungrouped frequency data is 20.22 years old. In 1939, 72% of women aged 25 to 34 years were married along with 77% for ages 35 to 44 and 69% for ages 45 to 54. 52% of women aged 20 to 24 were single and only 6% remained single at ages 45 to 54. During this period, the neutrality pattern could be described as universal because of a larger portion of women being married and less than 10% remaining unmarried at the end of the marriageable age 45 to 54. In the 1939 census, the SMAM or the computed SMAM was 23.2 years old. And according to the scholar, John Hutchnall, who focused on marriage and demographic studies, 
23 years old is already considered an indicator of late marriage. Furthermore, the computed Cole's index of marriage pattern was 0 0.54, which is below the threshold of 0 0.61, indicating late marriage. Actually, these figures or this MAM contrasted with the mean age of marriage in the Philippines in the early years, especially the female SMAM. In 1903 and 1939, the mean ages of marriage for the 50 provinces in the country were 20.9 and 21.9 years, respectively. Females in the city, in Baguio City, entered marriage much later by 1.3 years, illustrating the national neutrality trend. trend is disaggregated into patterns for municipalities and cities. We can already see that the city was already transitioning from early marriage to late marriage as evident in the 1939 census. During the post-war period, the mean age at marriage of 23 years old remained. The median age at marriage from 1945 to 1974 was around 23 years old, as indicated by the table 17. It's 23 years old, which is also the computed span for the 1972, 1970 to 1975 census. From 1975 to 1999, the median age of marriage increased to 24 to 26 years old, with a rise of 1.5 to 1.7 in 1980 to 1995. And the Princeton index remained between 0 0.46 to 0 0.49. We can also see in this graph that the percentage distribution of married female uh, for aged, ages 15 to 19 years old decreased in 1995, as well as for 20 to 24 years old. And this, however, the, the percentage distribution of married female for ages 25 to 29 actually increased in 1995. For the 21st century marriage affairs, we can see that the computed SMAM increased from 25 to 26, 27 years old, and the Coles uh, Princeton index dropped more to 0 0.32, indicating a more later uh, timing of marriage uh, during this period. We can also see in this graph that There are no more or declined, at least we can say no recorded existence of, of teenage marriage. There's a decline. And also there's a shift of the peak of the graph from 20 to 24 years old to 25 to 29 years old. So the number of female marriages changes from 20 to 24 to 25 to 29 uh, from 2000 to 2017. Now, the shift in Baguio City's neutrality patterns reflect the demographic response of its residents to various changes within the city. What actually drove these changes? We can explain this demographic phenomenon by examining urbanization, the feminization of education, and the shifts in occupational structure using the second demographic transition theory and Peter Smith's new neutrality model, which basically states that modernization, which includes urbanization, education, and diversification of occupational structures or roles, 
triggers postponement of marriage or changes in strategies, strategies of family formation. Urbanization is assessed by examining changes in the population growth and the influence of sex selective immigration. The feminization of education is evident through increasing female literacy in college education rates and the feminization of labor force is explored by analyzing the proportions of women in the labor force. When we plot these quantitative measures within the spatial and temporal context, we see a fascinating picture emerge. As Baguio City transitions from its historical roots as Cafagüe to its current status as a regional hub in the Cordillera region, we observe corresponding shifts in marriage behavior from an aggregate perspective. Population growth in Baguio City actually exhibited a notable sex-selective characteristics. Initially, the city had a predominantly male population, as seen in the sex ratio. Sex ratio above 100 means there is more male in the population than female and it decreases uh, to from 1918 to 1939. And this is attributed to the era of construction and road building projects in Baguio cities. And as economic dynamics evolved, as well as the, the Baguio city from being a colonial uh, hill station to a university town, it transformed into a more feminized urban center. As we can see from this graph, there are more females than male in, in the city. Um, the light shade is the female, while the darker shade is for the female, uh, for the male population. This change can be attributed not only to the number of women born in the city, but also to their act participation in the migration to Baguio. We have moved from a migration-making population male to a migration-making population female. The city's transformation to an educational hub led to higher rates of female literacy and academic attainment as seen in this graph. Furthermore, the female workforce participation also increased, reflecting greater involvement of women in the labor market. From 1970 to 1995, the percentage distribution of female uh, actually increased in, in, in 1995, as seen in this graph. The transition of Baguio City's marriage patterns from early to late marriage reflects the complex changes in the socio-economic landscape of the city. These changes adjusted and transformed women's status and gender roles. While marriage is now an option, it is also being postponed and delayed, we can still say that marriage still remains prevalent, resilient, and persistent. It is important to remember that this is an aggregate study and generalizations in history and social sciences can be inherently flawed. Nonetheless, the aggregate historical study serves as a starting point for discussions on how we can deepen our understanding of the marriage history of Baguio City. One common question I encountered about this study is what's the point of writing about this? It's as if people doubt whether narrating the story behind the numbers is genuinely interesting. However, it is through these narratives that we uncover the essence of our shared history. Maraming salamat. A pleasant day.
So thank you for that lecture, Marinelle. Now, before I move on and introduce the next speaker, I'd like to remind everyone in the audience that right after the next lecture, we will be having a question and answer section. So I'd like to invite you to write down questions or um, takeaways that you have from the lecture. Now, the next lecture will be by Jeff Mitzel Paran. Like I said, he is a product of the BA Social Sciences Program, major in history and minor in political science. He is a proud Ibaloy from Baguio City and is currently studying law at Malcolm in the University of the Philippines, Diliman. He graduated with top honors from UP Baguio, summa cum laude, and is deeply committed to social justice and aims to use his education to make an impact on society. With a strong foundation in history and policy, he seeks to address important issues and promote awareness about the historical struggles of the Ibaloys. And his lecture is entitled um, The Forgotten Ibaloy Clan of Cafaguay, The Historical Reconstruction of the Pirazo Clan. Jeff? And I am a fresh graduate of A pleasant day, everyone. I am Jeff Mitzel Paran, and I am a fresh graduate of the University of the Philippines, Baguio, under the College of Social Sciences, wherein I took BA Social Sciences, major in history and minor in political science. It's a great honor and privilege to be able to present my thesis entitled The Forgotten Ibaloy Clan of Cafaguay, The Historical Reconstruction of the Piraso Clan for the 114th Baguio Charter Day Anniversary Lectures. So before we begin to know who Piraso is, I think it's better for us to understand my motivations and at the same time inspiration to take in this research. So in front of you are two photos. The first photo is a photo of my grandfather along with his brothers. So Jaime Paran is my grandfather and besides him are Lolo Reynaldo, Lolo Joseph, and Lolo Ed Paran. The relevance in this research is that they are the sons of Roland Paran who accompanied him in their migration to Valencia Bukidnon. And below them is a picture of Lolo Pastor, the main researcher of the clan. He was the one who produced a lot of primary sources when it comes to the genealogy of the family, primary sources that would allow them to pursue their ancestral land claims. That's the reason why he's relevant in this research because most of the primary sources that I used are primary sources that he himself created. So let's talk about the motivations for this research. So the first motivation that I have in this research is to actually counter the homogenizing impact of national histories. Because we all know that when we talked about national histories, most of the time, these are histories that came from uh, capitals here in the Philippines. So for example, in Cebu, in Manila, and sometimes it's very important for us to know that those in the periphery, most especially those who are away from the capital, their histories are often unheard of. So the reason why I want to pursue this research is for me to be able to contribute in the local history of Baguio City, for us to be able to know the different experiences by those who are in, who we consider as ordinary people at the end of the day. And secondly, I want to talk about the lack of Ibaloy ethno history. So I think it's very important for me to discuss the difference between an ethnography and an ethnohistory. So an ethnography are actually accounts of the different cultural practices that indigenous people, indigenous peoples practice, right? What makes it an ethnohistory is that it transcends the spatial and temporal contexts of these cultural practices. So that's what ethnohistory would like to capture, the transformation and differences that happened during a period of these cultural practices. And the third motivation that I have is the lack of literature about the Piraso clan. Because in status quo, most of the ethnohistory that we have are about uh, the Cariño clan. So we have, 
for example, auto shearers on Baguio's past. And the reason why I want to continue on with this research is for me to be able to contribute to the array of perspectives that we have, right? So not only do we have a perspective coming from the Carino clan, but we'd also like to contribute coming from the Piraso clan as well, given that not much uh, perspectives are included currently in status quo. And fourthly, we have a motivation, which is to actually explain why there are Ibaloy communities in Valencia Bukidnon. Because Valencia Bukidnon is very far away from Baguio City and Menguet. So we'd like to know what could have been the reason during the period of their migration of, of why they were incentivized or motivated to migrate outwards from their homeland. So these are the questions that I intend to answer during the scope of this lecture. So number one, I'd like to present who the Ibalois are. Secondly, I would like to present and introduce who Piraso is, what was his relevance in Baguio's history. Third, I would like to ask what could have been the living situation in Baguio City that provided push factors for the different Ibaloys to migrate southwards to Valencia, Bukidnon. And at the same time, I'd like to ask what could have been the pull factor of why they intend to stay in Bukidnon. And lastly, I'd like to explain the relevance of this research when it comes to the local history of Baguio City. So first, let's begin with the first question of who are the Ibaloys of Cafaguay? So for this one, uh, I consulted Bagamaspad and Hamada Pawid's A People's History of Benguet. This is wild, widely available in the different libraries that I mentioned earlier. And there are two factors that we could consider when it comes to identifying who the Ibaloys are. So the first factor is when it comes to language. If they speak the Nabaloy language, then we could consider them to be Ibaloys. So now that we know that, the second factor could be if they are part or if their ancestors were part of the migration process that happened earlier in the Ibaloy's history, wherein lowland communities coming from Ilocosur and Cagayan actually went uphill to the Benguet region and settled there, settled there permanently. So if these two factors were, uh, were met, by certain groups of people who speak Nabaloy and at the same time whose ancestors were, came from these areas going up to Benguet, then we could consider them as Ibaloys. Then secondly, let's try to answer the question, who is Piras of Cafaguay? So the first one is uh, auto shears on Baguio's past. So it's important for us to note that on Baguio's past is actually the chronicles of the Cariño clan. And it's very important for us to take note of this is because in their chronicles, they've made mention of two people, which is Capitan Polito, the first Capitan of Benguet, and secondly, Capitan Piraso. So Capitan Polito had a granddaughter named the Vingit, and the Vingit is actually the wife of Piraso. So later on, I'll be explaining the relevance of why this is important and how it could contribute to Baguio's local history. So the next one, I'll be presenting to you a snippet of a page in Bagamaspad and Hamada Pawid's A People's History of Benguet, wherein it showed Capitan Piraso as one of the township presidents of Benguet. And lastly, Shiva was also used as a reference because of the article of Dr. Julie Cabato, wherein as a descendant of Piraso as well, she talked about how Duban, which is now modern day Trancoville Barangay, used to be a farmland by the Piraso clan, but it eventually transformed into an urban center, at the same time a residential area. So these are the three references that are existing when we talk about Piraso. So this is the photo that I've been mentioning about. So as you can see here, the leaders and township presidents of Benguet, one of them is actually Piraso, who became the township president from 1904 to 1905. 
So another primary source is actually the genealogical family tree of the Piraso clan. So this was actually made by Pastor in his research in the different libraries to actually come up with a coherent and comprehensive family tree of the clan. So it's important to note that Pastor was hired by the Mercedes Salming Piraso Carantes Faustino Foundation Incorporated established last 2009. And this is one of the primary sources that they've made for them to come out, for them to be able to produce uh, sources when it comes to pushing for ancestral land claims of the clan. So as you can see here, uh, the history of the clan will start with Amkidit and Damia. Uh, they're important in Ibaloy history because they are known as the progenitors of Benguet nobility. So they had a lot of descendants and an important descendant here is Bigong. Bigong had two wives. The first wife is Boki and the second wife is Savina. What made this relevant is that Savina is actually the ancestors of the Carino clan. As you can see, Bigong and Savina had a son named Pablo Carino, wherein Pablo Carino married Calmin and they had another son named Mateo Carino. So that's from the second wife. What made our clan relevant in this situation is that our clan actually stemmed from the marriage of Bigong and Boki, the first wife, wherein they had a son named Endikas, and Endikas married Batikalang. So the two had a son, and the son is Capitan Piraso. As I've mentioned earlier, Capitan Piraso married the Vingit, which is the, great, the granddaughter of Capitan Polito. So Piraso and the Vingit had five children, namely Samay, Salming, Kotiling, Tomasa, and Kosen. So Tomasa Piraso married Peter Paran. So this is where the branch of our clan would branch out. And Tomasa and Peter had a son named Roland Paran. Roland Paran married Mary Camus Lee. And Roland and Mary had different children. So another primary source that I want to share in this lecture is the survey plan of Mateo Carantes. The reason why I'm showing this photo is because Piraso doesn't have any primary sources when it comes to the scope of his land ownings. That is why I had to rely on another reference for me to be able to distinguish the land ownings of Piraso. So as you can see here, this is a survey plan made by uh, or sponsored by Mateo Carantes when it comes to actually determining his land ownings for its sale to the different people as mentioned here in this photo. So as you can see, we can distinguish a lot of familiar names here in Baguio City, which is Pakdal, Lukban, Alod, Boted, Lubnab, and Antamok. And as you can see here, we have uh, names or parcels of land named to Piraso. So as you can see here, the lands of Piraso could be seen along Pakdal Creek, Alod Creek, and in between Boted and Lubnab Creek. You could also see here the land ownings of Mateo Carino. Speaking of Mateo Carino, I also used his land surveys when it comes to distinguishing parts or parcels of land owned by Piraso. As you can see here, uh, along the road to, Lo uh, road to Loacan are also parcels of land named to the Igorot Piraso. So that's another primary source that I use to distinguish the land ownings. So for this one, this is actually a very important document. This document is an agreement between oh, Benguet's first civil governor with Marsh. So as you can see here, it was entitled Numero Treste. In this document, it stipulated the intent of the city government of Baguio to actually buy the parcels of land of Piraso and Salming along the baguio Pusorobi Road. So as you can see here, it's the signature of Whitmarsh. And at the same time, 
you have here the thumb marks of Piraso and Salming. What we could get from this document is that the indigenous peoples back then, uh, not most were actually literate to know how to read or write. That's why when it comes to approving these documents, uh, it's safe to assume that thumb marks were used to actually certify their intent. So as you can see here, it's a public document wherein both Piraso and Salming were mentioned. So this is another primary source that I used, wherein it's a court order that stipulated the division of properties to the heirs of Piraso. So I think we also need to understand what was it like living in Baguio and at the same time, what made Bukid non-conducive for settlement, right? So Baguio City during that time, as mentioned by Dr. Rakabato, was experiencing a rapid urbanization, right? Because we also have here the Baguio Town Site Formation, wherein it allocated lands, regardless if it's native land for public use when it comes to the development of Baguio City. So with the urbanization of Baguio, not only the, did the government took parcels of land, but the locals as well sold their lands for them to be able to purchase or procure basic necessities and at the same time investments when it comes to going to different provinces for migration, right? So you have here the descendants of Piraso because of the rapid urbanization of Baguio City and with state intervention. So primarily this is the creation of the National Resettlement and Rehabilitation Administration under the Magsaysay Presidency, wherein a lot of indigenous peoples, communities from Baguio City migrated outward and some of them went to Valencia Bukidnon. And Valencia Bukidnon during that time was underdeveloped and at the same time sparsely populated. So for the national government to increase the productivity of the province, they opted to make it as one of the Nara sites for them to be able to benefit in the area's productivity. So in 1954, you have here the exodus of indigenous peoples and the entry of lowland Christians to Baguio City, and also the descendants of Piraso actually benefiting from the resettlement program. So in front of you is an original certificate of title given by the national government to Roland Paran, one of the pioneers of the Piraso clan when it comes to settling in Valencia Bukidnon. So as you can see here, Roland Paran actually benefited and was given 12 hectares of land in Valencia Bukidnon. And this is a certified true copy coming from the Registry of Deeds. So here, this is my interview of Lolo Jaime, and this one is my interview of Lolo Val, or Lolo Reynaldo Paran. So these are the salient findings of my research. So for the first one, we've learned that the progenitor and origins of the Piraso clan originated from Amkidit of Chuyo and Damia Fakupan, the progenitors of Benguet nobility. And secondly, uh, we were able to distinguish a rough estimate of the land ownings of Piraso in Baguio City, wherein we reckon that it was from Pakdal or Navy Base all the way to Happy Homes. And we've also learned that during the urbanization of Baguio City, uh, Bag the Baguio Townside Formation actually affected the different land ownings of the different Ibalois in Baguio City. And at the same time, it increased migration, may it be outwards or inwards to Baguio, depending on who, whose perspective we are to take. So also we talked about the waves of migration to Valencia. In my research, I talked about two waves of migration. So you have the migration to Valencia, the first one being the establishment of the National Resettlement and Rehabilitation Administration. And second one is during the martial law. And lastly, you have the impact of aggressive selling, wherein 
a lot of Ibaloy sold their lands here in Baguio City for them to be able to buy more lands in Valencia Bukidnon or any other Nara sites. So that's it for today's lecture. I hope that you were able to learn a lot when it comes to the local history of Baguio City coming from the perspective of the Piraso clan. If ever that you have questions and clarifications, feel free to raise those later during the Q&A session. But you could also contact me in these uh, different channels. So you have here my email address, my LinkedIn profile, and at the same time, my contact number. Thank you so much and see you later. Okay, thank you for that, um, Jeff. Now, before we proceed to the Q&A, for the benefit of those who just entered the Zoom room, I'd like to do a recap of both lectures by um, Jeff and Marinelle. These topics on marriage history and family history show how the changes in uh, the local ethnoscapes of Baguio City are a result of so many uh, intervening and intersecting factors. So they show how people make a place, how state-sponsored and state-sanctioned processes and institutions like marriage, um, urbanization, resettlement, alter or affect the life ways of um, people in Baguio. In particular, Jeff's presentation shows how family histories can shed a lot on the history of a place like the city of Baguio. His work is an example of how by following something we can actually uncover a rich repository of knowledge. So for the students who are here, if we know George Marcos, di ba sabi nga niya, kung may gusto daw tayong aralin, let's follow the people, follow the thing or the object, follow the story, follow the metaphor or the plot, or follow the conflict. Now, Jeff shows that, and this is for the audience who want to do um, their own research. Now, he shows that there is a wide array of sources which we can turn to if we want to know more about something. So, pinakita nga niya, now we can look at court documents, we can look at genealogies or our family trees, um, oral histories. And he shows that we have to disabuse then ourselves from thinking that research is only fieldwork. We can also do homework or begin at home. Now, on Marinelle's end, she shows us that uh, changes in marriage patterns are driven by a lot of factors. And she says, I mean, she doesn't say this directly, but in her presentation, we can gather that sometimes love isn't enough for people to enter into the special contract of marriage. And there are other considerations, such as economic considerations and urbanization. Now, Marinelle also shows us that um, the final destination of a relationship, as, at least for the perspective of, of the women that and uh, in, in the records that she studied, is not necessarily marriage. People now have the agency or the, the, the choice to make decisions whether or not they want to postpone their marriage, to not get married at all, or to cohabit instead of entering into that special contract. Now, given that, I'd like to open the floor for your two questions from the audience. So I see no questions at the moment. Now, while the audience, people in the audience are still thinking of questions to ask, I'd like to invoke my moderator privilege and ask uh, general and specific questions uh, from our speakers. So Marinelle and Jeff, are you here in the Zoom room with us? Kindly turn on your cameras if you're here. Hello po. A pleasant afternoon, everyone. Yeah, and good afternoon. So what do you like? Do we go to the specific questions first that I have for each of you or to the general one? Habang nag ang audience. I think for me, it's okay if we go to the general questions first. Para hindi po mahirap. <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's, ano, let's, let's go to the general questions first. Now for... Question lang naman, isa lang naman. I have a question for both of you because you've done in your research the groundwork so for, for your respective topics. So to Jeff, it's on um, family history, ethnic history, and then we have Marinelle on marriage history. Uh, are there recommendations that you have for the students in the audience who want to pursue the same topics? So in other words, ano kaya yung, kung ano yung ginawa mo, Jeff or ni Marinelle, na 
pwedeng ibahin ng future re- ng researchers sa future trabaho na gusto nilang gawin sa topics na napili ninyo. I can go first. Bob. Can you hear me? Hello, everyone. Um, for me, my recommendations. I I actually wrote the the research in an aggregative aggregative uh, perspective. It's an aggregate study. It means it's in a macro level. It's, it's the numbers all only uh, reflect the mass phen- phenomenon because it can be quantified. And there are other um, elements in marriage history that cannot be quantified like love, like the perspective of people about marriage, their beliefs, and so on and so forth. So my recommendations are, of course, one is to closely look at the marriage transformation of the Ibaloy's marriage practices, because this is a macro perspective. I wasn't able to look um, in detail how the marriage practices of Kalon and Kaisi changed as the time passes by and how the decision making um, changed from parents to for this women and female. So uh, we can track uh, maybe I, I'm not sure how the method would be for that, but I'm pretty sure that it, it can be done for 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 a specific uh, Ibaloy family like like what um, Jeff has studied. Also, for the method, I, I used simple statistics formulas for, for, for the numbers, but it would be, I think it would be better if uh, it can be done through a family reconstitution technique where the historian or the student of history will use parish sources. Actually, it was the, the we have lots of parish sources that that's still yet to be used. That is what Peter Sinas is referring to, to his book in Population History. We have parish sources because, because we have lots of churches and we can do the, the family reconstitution technique by following actually a certain family, a uh, genealogy family, and, and check uh, at what age did they get married? Did they have their children? Because in parish sources, uh, they are available on those on those on those documents. So how I wish I was able to use those, but because of pandemic, I actually wrote the thesis during the pandemic, so I wasn't able to to go to Baguio City for for a request for parish sources. So another recommendation is yeah to actually look at marriage as a social drama. It's composed of people, so this is just the beginning. Number is the beginning. But there are a lot of more stories behind the marriage, especially the marriage quality, not just the quantity. So they can also uh, work on divorce since uh, in, in, in a document, um, Nabaloy style, it, it, it's actually divorce is, is common in, in an Ibaloy uh, marriage or tradition. So maybe they can also look at that and it can be relevant on on our current discussion of, of divorce in the Philippines. So those are the recommendations so far for my work. <laughs> so yeah, uh, I wish you. everyone everyone can or any history student can can work on that. Thank you for that, Marinelle. And right, because you, you did this during the pandemic. So you actually your research shows how we can wield the power of the digital sphere no, to do research. So it's a good example of that. Now, um, your, your answer naman, Jeff, before we go to the questions from the audience. Yes. Uh, thank you, Ma'am Carmine. Thank you, Ma'am Marinel. Uh, as for me, what I could recommend is to approach different government offices or even private offices for that matter when it comes to your research. Like while I was conducting my research, I approached several offices uh, from the National Archives of the Philippines down to the National Commission on Indigenous Peoples. Uh, more importantly, the N- NI- NCIP, because it's because of one of the people who helped me in the NCIP, whom I was able to uh, get a lot of insights for where I could find different primary sources when it comes to histories of the Indigenous Peoples. Like, for example, I was uh, directed to look for 
court orders because they told me that most of the things that I could use in my research could are there in the court orders, more importantly during the American period. At the same time, uh, when I approached the National Archives of the Philippines as well, uh, you have a lot of bundles to look for, and it's a good experience for us history students to conduct uh, archival research. But more surprisingly is that most of the primary sources that I got are from the, from the repositories of my relatives. So it's an interesting fact that sometimes you don't have to look elsewhere because most of the treasures that you could find are in your backyard or in your attic or home. And you could scour through those different documents to see what you could look for. And in those documents and different artifacts, you could come up with a good story. And speaking of good stories, uh, you don't have to look elsewhere as well because you could ask your grandfathers and grandmothers when it comes to their experience for those who would like to talk about, uh, for example, if we're going to talk about the history of Baguio uh, from the time of the Japanese forces or the American forces, you could easily ask your grandfathers and grandmothers for their experience because their experience is very important. It gives a good perspective on what happened during that time what was the per, uh, what do you call this what was the general idea or perspective or general behavior and uh, feeling of the people during such period of history so my recommendations for budding historians especially those who are going to take their thesis this semester or next semester is for you to come up with a history or come up with a topic that you are passionate about. Because by coming up with a passionate topic, uh, you'd be able to have fun during your academic pursuits. And at the same time, you'll be able to get a lot of insights to the interest that you would like to pursue in the future. So I think that's all for me. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff and Marinelle. I hope the people in the audience, whether they're students who want to, per who are going to enter their thesis stage or whether they're just um, you know, ordinary citizens who want to know more about uh, the history of Baguio through their families and through other records. No? I hope that those in the audience were able to gather a lot from both Jeff and Marinelle. Now let's go to the question from an anonymous, uh, from, from, uh, from one of the participants. The question is for Marinelle on marriage history. So was the general trend of women marrying later affected by the LGBT being more prevalent in the last decades? Now, what would be the significance of this study on the continuous fight for same-sex marriage? And the participant is asking because the research would be interesting with same-sex marriage added into the data. Thank you for, for that question. Well, I didn't uh, tap on the same-sex marriage on the study, but, but I actually... Um, uh, what do you call it? Discuss it a bit in 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 the thesis because in two thousand three and two thousand eleven, uh, those are the the years that Baguio City actually uh, conducted a mass same sex wedding, at least according to one article in a newspaper, Sunstar. So, uh, based on this uh, on this on this information, I can see that. Baguio City actually uh, is supporting uh, the institution of marriage, not just for allowing uh, or for not just uh, conducting same-sex same-sex marriage, but also uh, conducting mass weddings uh, for 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 people for couple in cohabitation. So, what's the the? I'm sorry, <laughs> the the relevance of 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 this study, um. That is where uh dun, dun na po kung yung detailed uh uh na, na pag-aaral sa marriage pa po within uh Baguio City kasi kuno din sinabi ko kanina macro level yung pagtingin ko hindi ko nakita kung ano pa yung iba pang nangyayari like uh civil wedding, cohabitation, common law marriage, and then same sex marriage. Kung paano yung trend lalo na na hindi naman sila represent, represented sa statistics natin sa census. So, mas maha, mahalaga din po na, na dito pa lang, dito na nagsisimula na baka may mga records na 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 
nagbibigay ng information about about this kind of marriages. Actually, yung traditional marriages, marriages hindi po yan stipulated sa 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 national statistics natin or sa mga numbers natin. So, uh, doon tayo magsimula na tingnan yung uh, iba't ibang marriage forms at kung paano sila nag-change sa school time. Yeah, thank you for that, Maganel. I hope that addressed the question. Uh, before we go to Jeff, kasi there's a question for Jeff. Uh, meron kasi yung uh, direct message na naisend sa akin sa chat. It's related to Marinel's uh, study. So I'd like to address this first. I'd like us to address this first bago tayo mag-move sa um, Piraso clan. So the question is from um, Ms. Roda. Good afternoon for the first lecturer. Education was one of the factors that contributed to the decline in marriage rate. Does this imply that the more educated a person is, the less they are, the less they are to marry if they are in an urban area? When I, a part of my study actually uh, discussed about what's the meaning of marriage timing or late marriage timing in Baguio City. One is, does it mean there is a persistence of inequality? Does it mean that cohabit, uh, cohabiting couple or cohabiting female, uh, cohabiting couples means they are less educated, they have uh, less economic power, and those that are marrying late have this, they are more educated or they are more um, wealthy or richer. Uh, for me, it's actually hard to to point out that right now or to say that it's the case because there are different uh, attitudes, uh, uh, I'm sorry, different attitudes uh, meron ang mga babae sa marriage. So, hindi madaling sabihin na kapag late marriage timing ay, late marriage timing ay mas ma, mas educated, tapos kahabitin ay, Hindi. Kasi pwede namang pumili ang mga babae ngayon na ay ayoko muna mag-asawa. Kahit educated ako, ayoko muna mag-asawa. Maya na lang ako mag magpakasal, mag-PhD muna ako. May choices na sila ngayon. Kaya mahalaga din na sa ngayon, tingnan na, tingnan na in, a, in maybe in, in an interdisciplinary perspective na kung ano na ngayon yung attitude ng mga babae towards marriage. Pero tatandaan natin na ngayon, marriage is already an option. Hindi na siya, hindi na siya yung one-time destination na lang. Marami ng option. So, hindi madaling sabihin na ganun ang magiging association. Na pag cohabiting or late marriage. And I also want to point out that there's no decline. The, the decline in marriage rate, it's, it's not really significant in my work. The marriage is still prevalent. It's still it's still high. However, there is a delay. The the women are delaying the marriage, but they are still marrying. So it's not a, it's not it's not the one time destination. It's already an option, but women are still marrying. At least in my study, think about. <laughs> Thank you, Marinel, for clarifying your finding. Now we go to Jeff. Um, from Kevin Conrad Ibasco, I'd like to ask what ko ano raw yung period when the Ibaloy migration to Kafag migration or perhaps out migration siguro ito um, out migration from Kafagway kung kailan okay, wait sorry let me rephrase um, Kevin would like to know what period did the Ibaloy migration I assume this is out of Kafagway. When did that begin? And what factors contributed to that occurrence? Thank you, Kevin, and thank you, Mom Carmen. So for the out-migration of the Ibaloys in Kafagway, in my research, there are two waves of migration. So the first wave of migration happened around the 1950s with the passage of the National Resettlement and Rehabilitation Administration wherein the government sponsored a lot of out-migration from Luzon, Visayas, down to Mindanao. So the rationale of the Magsaysay administration was to make productive the sparsely populated areas in 
uh, the Mindanao region. But there were, there are a lot of conflicting theories as well, stating that this reha this resettlement is a form of uh, what they call this pacifying descent in the southern regions of the Philippines. So that's one thing that we could look at. So around the 1950s, during the passage of the NARA or the National Resettlement and Rehabilitation Administration, uh, a lot of people from the Benguet region as well as Northern Luzon participated in the program. And one of the people who, part who benefited was, of course, our clan uh, in the person of Lolo Roland Paran, who got 12 hectares of land in Valencia, Bukidnon. So that's the first wave of migration from Benguet to Bukidnon. And the second wave is during the martial law era. So why is it the second wave? Uh, my other Lolo, Lolo Reynaldo Paran, or Lolo Val, was actually part of that mig migration because a lot of uh, Ibalois who have relatives in Bukidnon also shifted or also traveled to Bukidnon to escape the perils or the abuses of the Marcos regime during the martial law era. And thus, by being in Bukidnon or in Mindanao, uh, it would uh, it would lead to them avoiding uh, what they call this political persecution at the end of the day. So those are the two waves of migration outside of uh, going out of Kafagway. And if we talk about in migration, uh, we could look to Kising's theory wherein he mentioned that even before the Spanish occupation of the Philippines, uh, the people from the Lingayan coast and as well as the Ilocos Sur region migrated upwards to the Benguet province or Benguet region because of three reasons. So the first reason is the abundance of meat, given that uh, some during the earlier times, they were nomadic, uh, nomadic in nature. So uh, they were hunting for their sources of food and their Cordillera highlands uh, are abundant when it comes to meat sources. Secondly is when it comes to trade source resources, primarily the Cordilleran region has a lot of lumber, beeswax and honey according to Kising, that's why a lot of uh, lowland communities went upwards for them to be able to harvest these trade materials easily and more efficiently. And lastly, and more importantly, uh, it's to escape the Spanish authorities during the occupation of the Philippines. That's why a lot of the lowland communities went upwards and became remontados or yeah, those who are trying to escape the Christianization of the Spanish. So if we're going to look at the map that I showed earlier, as you can see, most of the migration happened along rivers because according to Kising and his theory, uh, what facilitated the movement upward by the lowland communities are these rivers, these riverine systems, and it actually guided these lowland communities to settle upwards. So that's one thing that we could talk about and think about when it comes to understanding how lowland communities were able to reach the Benguet area and became Ibaloy uh, during in the long run. So was I able to answer your question, Kevin? Thank you. Yeah, nag my heart react. So I guess that you were able to address the question. I see no other questions from the audience. Now I'd like to invoke na my moderator privilege and ask this uh, question from you, Jeff. Since Marinel was able to address two questions, I'd like to, to add more to your headaches, Jeff. <laughs> because your title, I'm, I'm, in, I'm intrigued by the title of your research. Yung title mo kasi ay, um, The Forgotten Ibaloy Clan of Baguio. Uh, for, for those in the audience, maybe you would like to elaborate on this title, as in, Forgotten by whom? And perhaps you also would like to elaborate why it is important for us to remember. So the reason why I chose the title, uh, The Forgotten Clan of Kafaguay, Piraso Clan, is because I believe that if we're going to look at it objectively, this is me removing myself as part of the clan as well, is that a lot of Ibaloy clans were able to contribute when it comes to the creation of Kafaguay or the different communities here in Benguet, right? But currently in status quo, uh, we only have a limited perspectives uh, coming from a, a very limited number of clans when it comes to their perspective on how they were able to contribute to the betterment of Baguio City at the end of the day. So I believe that for us to be able to 
create a diverse repository of our local history. We continue. We need to continue engage the different clans of Ibaloy or other ethno-linguistic groups currently residing here in Baguio City for us to be able to have a rich uh, cultural history. It's because of their struggles at the end of the day that we, will be, we can appreciate how Baguio came to be. And at the same time, I know that their ancestry contributed a lot during the resistance uh, against the Spaniards or at the same time helping build a metropolitan area here in Baguio City, which we now know and love today. So the reason why it's Forgotten Clan is because, just like what I've said earlier, uh, it's interesting that uh, our clan is, uh, what they call this, related to the first Capitan of Benguet. And if we're going to read the chronicles made by Otto Shearer, it's because of the interaction between Bigong and Capitan Polito, as facilitated by Comandante Galvi, that actually made uh, Polito the first Capitan of Benguet. It's because of Bigong's refusal and because of the fact that Bigong had a grandson in the name of Capitan Piraso and because of the marriage between the Vingit and Piraso was the reason why Bigong recommended Polito to be the next Capitan or the first Capitan of Benguet. And I think that's very interesting. And these are the snippets of history that we tend to forget or something that we don't necessarily learn about in schools and we only get to learn about in libraries. And the bad part here is that none of us or I think a little number of people nowadays would actually go to the library to look for knowledge for the sake of knowing more, right? And for example, even me, I didn't even know that history uh, unless I didn't have my thesis, right? So I think it's better for us to continue uh, digging through the treasure troves of historical knowledge that we have that could be seen in these libraries in oral histories and at the same time primary sources scattered around or even hidden for us to be able to know more about Baguio City. And I know that Baguio City as a city is relatively new or it's not, it's not that old, right? So I think what we captured in the present day is the history that is written by the Americans or what we've known during the Spanish occupation. But I think it's better for us to keep on digging, uh, knowing what happened even before the Spanish occupation, or at the same time, know those histories that happened during the occupation of the city for us to know what or how the city was able to be created by the different communities and at the same time residents of Baguio. Because I think at the end of the day, uh, it is better for us residents of Baguio City to create our own histories, to continue funding researches for us to be able to know more and for us to have these types of events and uh, conferences for us to be able to share our findings at the same time, continue to enrich the history that we have. So was I able to answer the question? Thank you, Ma'am Carmine. Yes. Oh, Ma'am. Yes, thank you, Jeff. <laughs> thank you. Um, and I like how you mentioned marriage, which shows that your topic and Marinelle's topic coincide at different, uh, at different um, how do you say it, different points. Now, um, we started at 1.40. It's almost 3 o'clock. The next panel is at 3 o'clock. As uh, much as we would like to accommodate questions, if, if there are, any more questions, uh, we need to yield to the next panel. Anyway, Jeff posted his email and his contact details, LinkedIn. Marinelle maybe would like to be contacted as well via email or social media or LinkedIn. You can connect, the audience may connect to these two people um, later on. Um, I hope or we hope that the audience, whether you're academics or non-academics, citizens of Baguio, we're, uh, the audience, yeah, yeah, you in the audience were able to gather a lot from um, these lectures and add that to your knowledge of um, Baguio City. We know that Baguio City is 114 years old today, and that 114 years, what we've discussed so far, is just the tip of the iceberg. Now, in our recognition, um, of the participation of the two lecture lecturers. Yeah, I'd like to call you lecturers, co-learners. Um, I'd like to read your virtual certificate of appreciation and award it virtually to you too. So please let me read the contents. A certificate of appreciation is hereby awarded to Ms. Marinelle Bendichon, 
Um, and the same to Mr. Jeff Mitzel Paran for sharing invaluable findings and insights from the research work during the 114th celebration of Bamu Charter Day held jointly by the College of Social Sciences and the College of Science this 12th of September, 2023, virtually, signed by Assistant Professor Franz Yoshi, the second chairperson of the CSS Lecture Series, and Dr. Leah Abayo, Dean of the College of Social Sciences. So thank you very much, Marinelle and Jeff, for sharing with us the findings of your research. We know that uh, the punctuation of a research work doesn't end with the final submission in academia. It goes beyond that. And it's extremely important for us to disseminate to the public what we find um, about the public to the public, right? So for the next panel, it's going to begin at 3 p.m. Um, Ms. Kili, kindly send in the evaluation form so those in the audience kindly um, fill out or yeah, fill out the form and submit your evaluation. So thank you again so much. And please stay on for the 3 p.m. panel to be moderated by um, Professor Mailinita Pinyalba. Thank you, Jeff. And thank you, Marinelle. Thank you, Ma'am Carmen. Thank, thank you for so the much. opportunity, Po. Thank you so much, Jeff and Marinelle. And thank hope you, to see you again, yeah. face to face. And thank you, Carmen. I know you're doing this from, uh, from out of Bavio. And we welcome uh, Prof. Mai, who will be moderating the next panel, the, the, the Hi, good afternoon, panel everyone. and the last panel. Um, I hope Ramzeni is in. I see Ma'am Lynn Dayata ang nandito kanina, but I'm not sure if Ma'am Seni is here, Mai. I think we need to wait a bit. I see Ma'am Linda is here already, but uh, I think Ma'am Zeni is, maybe he's, she's coming from her class, but I'll check on her. Okay, so good afternoon, participants, our speakers. We're about to start in a few minutes.
Okay, welcome back. We are now on our last, um, third and last panel for this afternoon, and I am happy to welcome all the participants again and uh, our two speakers for this afternoon. So we have our Senior Ecosystems Management Specialist or Chief, Linda Claire Powit, and our very own UP Professor Zenaida Bowen. So to start with, I would like to introduce our first speaker. So Linda Claire Powid is from Sagada Mountain Province. She graduated with a degree in BS Biology from the St. Louis University in Baguio and a BS Education from the Baguio Central University. She also holds a master's in community development from the Benguet State University. And currently she is undertaking a PhD in rural development also from Baguio, uh, Benguet State University. She's been working with the NRCAR for 30 years, and now she is um, the current the Senior Ecosystems Management Specialist Chief in the Protected Area Management and Biodiversity uh, uh, con conversation, conversation section. <laughs> We now have um, our first speaker, Linda Claire Powell. Conservation. 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 <laughs> yeah. Okay. So thank you so much uh, for the introduction. Thank you, ma'am. And thank you to um, the organizers and UP for giving us a chance to share uh, to share the programs of DNR. Okay, so uh, I, let me share my screen and uh, proceed right away to my topic. So, um, Good morning, good afternoon, everyone, for all uh, students and for all who are listening. Thank you for joining us uh, this afternoon. So um, my topic for this um, afternoon will be the Urban Biodiversity Program of uh, DNR, of DNR, uh, DNR in general, but um, most specially, specifically, I'll be talking also about the program of DNR CAR on, on urban biodiversity. So... Um, so before we proceed, we have to understand the connection between urbanization and biodiversity. So the trend today, the trend today is that um, the general population are moving into urban areas. Um, it looks like uh, ang belief natin is the the success, the the more comfortable life is in urban areas. So ayan, uh, ang um, exodus is moving towards urban areas. And at this point in time, uh, we have more than one half of the population in the Philippines residing in urban areas. Okay. And uh, with the increase in population in urban areas, uh, it's putting pressure on the uh, ecosystems in the urban areas. So uh, before, in the early nine, in the early nineteen um, hundreds and up to the fifties, there was no problem in urban areas. It looks like there were wide spaces, there were green spaces, but uh, as the years came, um, the green spaces disappeared, and so. We now have this uh, um, uh, urban biodiversity to address these uh, cases. And so the Philippines is a uh, um, signatory to the United Nations CBD, the Convention on Biodiversity, Biological Diversity. And um, uh, the, it says here the recognition of the huge impact of cities in the areas of production, consumption, waste generation, and pollution, and habitat loss is in urban cities. So with the increase in um, 
economic activities in urban cities, uh, there is also an increase in employment. And there, of course, there is also an increase in uh, population. So um, uh, even the Sustainable Development Goals, uh, number 11, uh, talks about sustainable cities and communities. So uh, all the... Um, activities within urbanizing communities are increasing that uh, their the pressure on our ecosystems are already uh, so high so um uh, from that from the uh, sdgs and the um, agreements in the united nations uh, cbd uh, the philippines now own um, address this through the Philippine Biodiversity Strategy and Action Plan. So the Philippine Biodiversity Strategy and Action Plan also, um, also uh, targets the um, conservation of biodiversity within urban areas. And uh, this is so important because of the increasing population na, na pumupunta na sa ating uh, urban areas. Okay, so um, in the Philippines, we have the five largest cities, which is Quezon City, Cebu, Davao, Manila, and Caloocan City. So um, we, in the DNR, we piloted this, uh, these areas for uh, urban biodiversity programs, and uh, biodiversity assessments were done within this uh, within these big cities and uh, highly urban, highly urbanized cities. So um, um, for the pilot program, the DNR uh, conducted assessments of the remaining biodiversity within these uh, uh, highly urbanized cities. And also from the, from the biodiversity assessment, uh, some of these um, um, cities have uh, entered into an MOU with the with DNR for the conservation of the remaining green spaces and the biodiversity within the cities, and also for the preparation of a management plan for the conservation of these uh, of the biodiversity and remaining great green spaces and wetlands. Also, wetlands are very important within the cities. Uh, within highly urbanized cities, kasi yung ating wetlands, yung ponds, lakes, and the uh, marshes are becoming so polluted from uh, economic activities that they are not serving already the purpose of being wetlands. That should, uh, should be the kidneys of the earth to filter our waters and to contribute to uh, the reduction of the increasing uh, temperature. So yun sana yung... Uh, um, role ng wetlands, but uh, because of the high economic activities within these uh, urbanized cities, ayun, na pupolyut na at nasisira na ang ating wetlands din. So these were, these were the five cities that were piloted. Okay, so from the PBSAP, um, from the Philippine Biodiversity Strategy and Action Plan as a way of addressing our commitment to the CBD and our commitment to the attainment of the Sustainable Development Goals, um, urban biodiversity was identified as a new thematic area. So previously in the uh, earliest PBSAP that was prepared, uh, hindi talaga na-address ang biodiversity within urban areas. But uh, with the increasing uh, observations and the uh, um, increasing uh, pollution and destruction of green spaces and wetlands within urbanized uh, urbanized areas, where most of the population of the Philippines uh, are are found, eto na we are addressing it through this uh, Philippine biodiversity. It is incorporated in the Philippine biodiversity strategy and action plan. So the the target here now is to increase by 5% in the proportion of terrestrial natural areas in the five largest cities. So, yun na yung nakomit doon sa uh, five largest cities to at least increase by 5% the green spaces, terrestrial green spaces by 2028. And also by 2028, as a result of improved conservation, ecosystem services provided by key biodiversity areas will be enhanced. So uh, should be enhanced. So meaning 
We will have uh, more birds within green, our green parks in the cities. We will have more uh, flora and fauna. And um, uh, by including the urban biodiversity in the PBSAP, this presents the essential role of national and local government to protect urban biodiversity through management and restoration of public open spaces. Pero ayan, we, we also initiated the uh, MOUs, Memorandum of Understanding with, with uh, LGUs and other stakeholders because we cannot do it alone. For sure, we cannot do it alone. So in coordination with all stakeholders, eto na, after the assessment, at least we have now a uh, basic data of the uh, flora and fauna of the uh, urban areas, then we now um, um, assist in the preparation of the conservation uh, plan for the biodiversity within the cities, within the urban areas. So what were the initiatives on urban biodiversity? So yun, uh, um, technical workshops on refining indicators for city biodiversity index. So uh, uh, ever since we this was integrated, urban biodiversity was integrated in our PBSAP, um, DNR started to facilitate, and not just DNR, even other uh, national agencies started to facilitate um, activities uh, policies, policy formulation for the conservation of biodiversity within urban areas. So we started with biodiversity assessment, which is a benchmark uh, data gathering for the remaining floras and flora and fauna within our urban areas. Particularly, we started with the big five cities. And then the ser series of roundtable discussions on mainstreaming biodiversity in uh, urban areas, in the health sector, in the infrastructure sector. Kasi nga nakikita na, especially particularly for infrastructure, um, ito ang pinaka- uh, major ang destruction to biodiversity and green spaces within urban areas. And then uh, there were also webinar um, series on the integration of biodiversity in the infrastructure uh, sector and also partnership with uh, private sectors. Okay, so from this, we now had or we came up now with pipeline policies. So this, the, the workshops and the uh, discussions with all stakeholders now produce the guidelines or policies for urban biodiversity. So first is the um, um, DNR administrative order and the guidelines of the implementation of urban biodiversity program. So uh, at least we now have we now have basis on how to go about doing this uh, urban biodiversity within our all our urban areas. And then uh, next came the BMB technical bulletin on the urban biodiversity management planning. Okay, so uh, firstly, we conducted the assessment, as I have said, of flora and fauna within these uh, urban areas. And then now came the uh, technical bulletin, which will now guide us on the urban biodiversity management planning. Para naman, at least my guide, di ba? My faces, my steps, hindi, hindi lang tayo nag- nag um proceed on what we want to do, but at least we have now the guidelines. And then for DNR administrative order on blue-green infrastructure. So on the infrastructure side, uh, there is now also a department administrative order that will serve as a guide on how to do infrastructure which are environment-friendly, particularly uh, inside urban areas. Um, uh, like, for instance, um, constructing uh, rain catchment basins, um, allowing, um, uh, what do you call this, uh, materials that will, uh, that will uh, increase, increase uh, or that will use natural light instead of making use of energy. Yun po, yun yung, yun yung content ng uh, down na to on blue-green infrastructure. 
and the uh, BMB technical bulletin also on the development of urban forest bathing. So an example here, we have uh, the Janhe forest bathing uh, area. So uh, for all urban areas who will be developing now their uh, forest bathing, uh, we now have a guideline or at least a technical bulletin to follow. Okay, so ayon, um, from the guidelines, we now have pipeline programs and activities for urban biodiversity. So uh, uh, the establishment of urban forests, as I've mentioned, in urban forest bathing in selected protected areas and green parks. So green parks of uh, urban, urban areas. And uh, this is becoming a trend, itong forest bathing. And... Um, Building biodiversity-friendly urban um, urban development. Okay, so how do we do uh, urban conservation uh, in a city that is highly uh, urbanizing? Ayan. So at least we have now uh, programs on this, and we have guidelines and policies. Uh, mainstream biodiversity into key development sectors and plans. So uh, mainstreaming biodiversity. We are very thankful now that um, in the scorecard of the SGLG of the LGU, uh, the, 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 for good governance, the LGU is being scored for good governance. Uh, the biodiversity cons conservation is now included in their scorecard. Okay, so for, for urban uh, areas, for cities uh, that will undergo SGLG uh, scoring on their good governance, ayan, naka, at least naka mainstream na yung biodiversity and particularly uh, also wetlands, including wetlands. And um, next, the development and promotion of green and blue spaces. Yan. So um, in our guidelines for um, urban um, biodiversity, kung paano i iwasan ang mga uh, wetlands that will be uh, affected by developments and also green spaces. And also, kung noon, uh, sige, um, um, medyo nalawa pa imot. <laughs> um, meaning malawak pa parang ganun pero as of this time pag tinitingnan na natin wala na talagang natitira mm -hmm. application and promotion of green infrastructure so eto we also wanted to develop these guidelines for LGUs to uh, to have basis to prepare their policies so uh, when LGUs uh, approve buildings and um uh, construction of other infrastructure, sana naman um, ano, uh, environment friendly. Ayan. So even buildings, sana in Baguio, we are already um, short of water um, at some points in of the year, at some months of the year. So uh, baka pwedeng uh, ng policy ng Baguio City to, to include that all buildings should have uh, rain harvesting facilities that the uh, building should integrate um, um, clean energy in the construction of their buildings. Ayan. So green infrastructure. Habitat enhancement, urban areas, restoration, and species recovery. So ayan. Um, in uh, the city council is coming up with uh, with um, we call this a policy on the development of green spaces. So, maganda yan at uh, uh, it, the, um, the habitat of flora and fauna within the city will be enhanced and will be restored. And also, UP is conducting um, uh, research uh, within Baguio City also on um, um, invasive species. So, that will also help in species recovery. And then environmental education and promotion of urban biodiversity. So important did nito within urban areas to educate them on the importance of green spaces, on the importance of biodiversity that should be maintained uh, within the urban areas. Ayan. So specifically here in Baguio City, <laughs> Medyo lumalakas ang ulan dito. So specifically here in Baguio City, um, we started the Urban Biodiversity Program uh, two years ago. 
two years ago. So um, following the BMB Technical Bulletin 2018-2, which is a procedural guidelines in the conduct of assessment of urban biodiversity, we uh, conducted, conducted an, uh, a stakeholders orientation and we invited the uh, uh, the academe to include the UP Baguio and the St. Louis University uh, because we know that they are uh, uh, more experienced than us when it comes to this uh, uh, concern. And so together with the stakeholders, we also conducted the uh, reconnaissance in particularly in Busul watershed, uh, in Buyug watershed. Okay, alam ba ninyo kung saan yung Buyug watershed? <laughs> Uh, so, pakita ko yung picture mamaya. And then the creation of assessment team through uh, DNRSO. So, the assessment team composed again of the academe, uh, all stakeholders uh, like uh, the barangay officials, the bawadi, the sino pa ba? Uh, we have also NGOs. Ayon. So, ang, ang urban biodiversity na ini-implement natin is a collaborative effort. Kasi, yun nga, hindi namin talaga kaya kung kami lang sa DNR. And um, we conducted another stakeholders meeting for the drafting of the Memorandum of Agreement. So my Memorandum of Agreement kami with the stakeholders and we uh, we assigned tasks to each one and responsibilities to each of the um, um, organizations and stakeholders. And that was in May 6, 2022. So the draft MOA was um, was uh, presented, was reviewed and discussed by uh, by representative from each of the stakeholders. And uh, again, after that, we floated again the MOA for a further review. And then um, after that, we now conducted the signing of the MOA on October 10, 2022. And um, the fieldwork started in November, 20, November 2022 also. And um, we are so much thankful uh, for the um, expertise of UP Baguio on the flora and fauna assessment, which should be presented after my presentation. Very exciting ang result nito. So we, we, we could not uh, imagine na uh, kahit pala nasa urban, as in in the middle of the city, in the heart of the city, uh, it's so rich in flora and fauna. Uh, the initial report of these activities, which we already submitted to our central office at uh, in Manila, the BMB, the Biodiversity Management Bureau. Um, ayon, uh, they were they were um, also excited with the uh, with the result of this uh, work that we have done, and now they are requesting. They have uh, requested through targets now it's it's included in our target to include Kamchan Hay, Lucna, Busul and Forbes Park and other uh watersheds here in Baguio City so uh yon uh, medyo exciting kasi yung result for Buyo watershed and uh, we also find it important that we also do it with other green spaces remaining green, green spaces in Baguio Ayan. So I think this picture is what I was uh, talking about. So this is the uh, Buyug watershed, Kirino Hill, Pingat. Uh, it's surrounded by Kirino Hill, Pingat. And uh, down here is the um, Kamdas, Kamdas area, if you are familiar with this. So the first picture that you are looking at is in uh, a Google image in 2003. So, pagtitingnan natin ito, itong, itong red line pala is the um, boundary of the Buyug Watershed Forest Reservation. Okay, and this green, this strip is the remaining forest. So, ayan, uh, that, this was in 2003, makikita nyo may mga uh, bakante, bakante pa yung area ng mga to na may mga bahay eh. But this one is still brown kasi uh, hindi siya forested. This area uh, initially was not a forested area. But um, after 2003, um, there were 
DNR invited um, organizations and institutions to help in the in the reforestation of this area. So there were uh, institutions who adopted areas for develop for for reforestation. We have Academ also. We have Bawadi. Uh, nagtulong-tulungan sila to plant in this area. And by 2011, eto na ang itsura niya. It, uh, it started to regreen yung area na to. But you would, also, you would also observe that the residential houses surrounding it have also increased. Okay, so this was in 2011. And then after 2011, in 2017, eto na, medyo kumapal ng konti yung yung mga kahoy in 2017 okay kumapal din ang mga bahay <laughs> and then here finally in 2022 this was the um, latest google image that we got ayan and um, also on the ground as uh, we have uh, uh, conducted the biodiversity assessment ayan talagang forested na siya at saka may may um, may vegetation na siya talaga Okay, so this was in 2022, and uh, ayan, I think this is a very clear picture of an example of the of the pressure of the pressure that the population uh, that the population is um, impacting on our green spaces. So um, ayan, uh, the reason why we had to involve the city, the barangays, uh, the bawadi is. Um, Ayan, lahat lahat may may mga responsibilities on the conservation of this area. Okay? So ayan, that's the this is the pilot area that we have um, covered for um, starting 2021-2022. The initial uh, assessments were done in 2022. And only to find out that it has a wonderful uh, flora and fauna that should be conserved. Uh, para lang sana may uh, may um, breathable air and water within these areas na so populated. Ayan. So just looking at this picture, I hope we we can imagine how how uh, population and uh, urban activities are compressing and putting uh, pressure on our uh, ecosystems, natural ecosystems within the uh, urban areas. So, yun po ang pinaka-objective ng Urban Biodiversity Program ng DNR is to at least conserve the remaining, the remaining green spaces of these uh, uh, green spaces within these urban areas. So with that, I think that's my last slide. <laughs> I hope I shared something. Ayan po. And um, <laughs> nawala pala yung... Um, ayan po. So thank you so much, everyone, for listening. Thank you so much, Linda, Claire, Pawid. So if you have questions, you can reserve that for the question and answer session after Professor Zeniba Warren's presentation. I've taken notes. I have a couple of questions for you, ma'am, but uh, I'll wait <laughs> until it's time to ask you the burning questions of the day. <laughs> okay, Puma. Yes, okay. So let's now move to our uh, next speaker, our great professor from biology. So I'm going to read her short bio note. I did not bring my glasses, so I might be a little bit slow reading this. So just please indulge me. So Dr. Sinaida Budai Bawanan obtained her Bachelor in Science in Biology at the University of the Philippines, Baguio, and a Master's of Science and PhD degrees in Biology from the University of the Philippines, Diliman. She earned a postdoctorate fellowship at the University of Hawaii at Manoa, Honolulu, Hawaii, in the USA through the Fulbright Philippine Agriculture Advanced Research Lab. She has been with the Department of Biology, College of Science, UP Baguio, since 1994, teaching biology, invertebrate zoology, ecology, science 11, and um, seminar courses 
and has actively mentored graduate students of the MS Conservation and Restoration Ecology and undergraduate PhD students of the BS Biology program. She held relevant positions in the university and other scientific societies, having organized several conferences and workshops. In November 2021, she received an achievement award for serving as one of the pillars of the Philippine Society for the Study of Nature, the national network of professionals devoted to the study, preservation, and sustainable use of nature. Her expertise is in ecology and taxonomy, and she actively engages in multidisciplinary research. Her other accomplishments include papers published in international and national regional journals, book chapters, and conference proceedings. She has participated in local and international trainings, presented scientific posters and papers with invitations to review or referee research articles and project proposals. She advocates conservation and restoration efforts, particularly in promoting native species. Her current research are on African tulip, an emerging threat to Baguio City's green space funded by CSC Interdisciplinary Research Grant and assessment of bioinvasion and proliferation of exotic plant species in Camp Jan Hay Forest Reserve in Baguio City. A basis for the policy inputs on the management of exotic plants in promotion and restoration of native plants with funding from DNR Foreign Assisted and Special Project Services. Service. She serves as the biology department's focal person in tapping the expertise of the faculty in collaborating with other local agencies to harmonize the efforts in attaining a greener and sustainable city. And we are excited. We might be seeing a lot more pictures from Buyog Watershed. So let's now welcome Professor um, Sinaida Butai Bawana. Thank you so much, Prof. Uh, Mai. It's already getting Ano no, masyado yung malakas yung ulan ngayon, but I hope uh, the sound of the rain is not interrupting my audio. Okay lang ba? So okay. may I now, yeah, may I now share my screen? Okay, so um, Mom Claire Pawid of the DNR has already given a good introduction about my presentation for this afternoon. When the DNR uh, called me in particular, if UP Baguio would like to engage in this kind of effort, so hindi na kami dalawang isip, and uh, I'm glad that our department, the Department of Biology here in UP Baguio, agreed to share their expertise for us to be able to come up uh, with this study. And this is on the floral and faunal assessment within the Buyog Watershed Forest Reserve. So this is the area that you can see when you go to SM, parang maliit na patch lang ng forest na yon. So that's the Buyog Watershed. And I'm thankful to, uh, to the College of Social Science, uh, headed by uh, Dr. Dean Leia uh, Abayao for uh, inviting me to share our research for this afternoon's uh, webinar presentation. May, may I just start my presentation by acknowledging our team uh, composed of the members from uh, the Department of Biology, uh, from the Don Mariano Marx State University, and of course, from the DNR. So we, we formed some clusters to do a specific inventory of uh, the different uh, life forms. Uh, for instance, for the floral assessment, it's uh, being um, headed by Dr. Lizelle Mactoto of uh, the UP Baguio. And uh, some members uh, include Miss um, Coulter Sheriff, also a faculty of UP Baguio. And the rest are, are um, personnel from the DNR regional office, uh, like uh, Miss Ayocho. And then the, the rest are also uh, members of the DNR Senro. Now for the assessment of small mammals and herbs, um, this is uh, led by Dr. Aris Rehenaldo, again of uh, UP Baguio. And uh, we have here representations from the DNR Regional Office and CENRO. Now uh, for the birds, we have uh, Dr. Jocelyn Floresca from the Don Mariano Marcos State University, but she used to be a faculty under the Human Kinetics Program here at UP Baguio, but uh, she has moved to Dimsu. And uh, the members there are also 
again from the DNR. Now for the mollusks, I, um, I included some of my undergraduate uh, thesis advices, including Alea J. Potelo, uh, Renz, Renz Medina, and uh, Kian Olivares. I think their team is now in the classroom and uh, our students in the invertebrate zoology and uh, in, um, in Zoo 102 being handled by uh, Miss Mark Allen G. Marquez. So they are in campus and they are watching. Uh, you are not sharing your screen up, but I you may packet them students. But I'm I'm very I'm glad that uh, our students are able to uh, engage themselves in this kind of seminar because this is a realization that there's so much to do here in our backyard here in Baguio, and they can already do a lot of research especially for their thesis, uh, they don't have to go far from the city because uh, this can already serve as a laboratory, our immediate environment. And uh, for the assessment of arthropods, it's uh, led by um, Professor Meiji Bagangao, again from the Department of Biology, and some undergraduate students. We brought our uh, invertebrate zoology class in one of our field activities at Buyog Watershed, and they were able to document some of the uh, invertebrates that are found in the area. So to start with, uh, let me just um, give you a background or an overview of what the old Baguio City look like, looks like in 1930s and uh, how it was intended for only a capacity of uh, 30,000 individuals. So it's, it's not working. Um, okay. And uh, its current view, as uh, shared here in this uh, picture, this is taken from the National Geographic in May 1930, and this one is a photo from uh, Mr. Ompong Tan. And um, if we look at how it was designed, it was originally uh, intended for only 30,000 individuals or uh, inhabitants with a land area of only around 55 uh, square kilometer. So the population density back then was only uh, composed of 419 uh, or close to 420 individuals per square kilometer. But now we already have a population of 392. So you can see that um, many, many fold yung increase ng ating population density. And so for every square kilometer of land, we, we have now an inhabitants of uh, more than 6,000 people. And this is the current uh, um, um, demography here in the city. And uh, based on the United Nations Development Plan, the Earth's biocapacity is supposed to be 2.1 hectare per person. But in, in Baguio, um, per person is only allotted about 1.09 hectare. So we have already exceeded the carrying capacity in Baguio City. As uh, explained earlier by uh, Mom Claire Pawit, um, she stated the reasons kung bakit nag overpopulate na tayo in the city. Dahil nakikita nga that there are more opportunities here in the urban, here in uh, Baguio City, kaya nag -aakyatan. And of course, yung opening ng mga schools, not only for college, but also even in senior high, kaya dumadami pa talaga yung ating population. Uh, specifically pa pagka meron tayong mga activities like nagbinga, we're in tumataas, umaakyat ang maraming mga bisita. So you can just imagine kung gaano palaki yung demand with a small space, with water resource, and uh, limited lang yung ating mga resources. So uh, that's something that is quite alarming. And so if we now go through the urban uh, areas or the green spaces that was mentioned by Mom Claire earlier, so um, we, we now recognize that uh, it's very important to make a study on these uh, remaining urban areas or green spaces because um, we realize that there, 
there are still a biodiversity, there are still a lot of plants and animals that are existing within the urban areas. And so it would also deserve an equal attention. If we look at the remaining group, group, urban spaces in the city, um, we can see here that uh, much of our remaining spaces are already uh, made up of the built up areas. And our remaining uh, watersheds would include the Buyo watershed, the Busol watershed, uh, Puksusan watershed, very small na lang din siya. And then we have the Forbes Park, Part of Forbes Park is the Botanical Garden. And uh, the largest uh, remaining forest reserve in the city is Camp Janhei. So there is a uh, remaining 625 uh, hectares of the total land area of the city. Kaya more than 50% or 52% uh, of the remaining green spaces is actually composed of the uh, or covers the Camp Janhe area. That's why we are conducting a study uh, specific for Camp Janhe. And um, we go back now to the Puyo watershed. It was declared um, as a watershed forest reserve by virtue of the presidential proclamation number 93 by the then president Fidel Ramos. And the purpose of this uh, proclamation is to protect the, the and maintain or improve the water yield because that's the main purpose of the watershed, to improve the water yield and provide restraining mechanisms for inappropriate forest exploitation and disruptive land use. So obviously, hindi na meet itong demand na to kasi kagaya ng pinakita kanina ni, uh, ni Ma'am Claire ay maliit na lang yung remaining na forested area doon sa Buyog Watershed. And um, after the proclamation number 93, it was consigned under the administration and management of the Department of Environment and Natural Resource, the City of Baguio, and the Baguio Water District. Kaya yung source ng water natin uh, here in the city, uh, part of it is coming from the Buyog watershed. So um, the, the Buyog watershed was chosen due to, the, due to the alleged pressing issues, mainly on land use and water. As explained earlier, ikita nga natin na parang uh, ang liit-liit na lang yung, yung natitirang uh, forested area in this Buyog watershed. And so therefore, um, the study uh, that was conducted in, in uh, cooperation with uh, other stakeholders, na na mentioned na kanina ni Ma'am Claire, is for us to characterize and assess the physical, floral, and faunal components of the Buyog Watershed Forest Reserve. So ito yung main na contribution ng the Department of uh, Biology here in UP Baguio and uh, DIMSU with participation of Dr. Floresca. Now, specifically, uh, this project uh, aimed to characterize the forest types and to determine the dominant plant species in the area and to identify the faunal and floral species that are present, including their conservation status and endemism, and also uh, recommend conservation and protection efforts for the long-term monitoring of the area. And uh, in consonance with the uh, Biodiversity uh, Management uh, Bureau's technical bulletin, we follow these uh, procedures in the conduct of assessment of the urban biodiversity from uh, pre-assessment stage, then on the on-site assessment and uh, po post-assessment. That was already explained by Mom Claire. And uh, we followed um, standard procedures in sampling, flora, and fauna. And uh, the team was composed of the se several uh, faculty from the department and including our students and faculty from Don Mariano Marcos State University and the DNR. Um, if you can see here uh, the picture, na-explain na rin to kanina na itong uh, red na lines dito is the original uh, landmark ng Buyog Watershed, but you can see here na maliit na nga lang yung forested area. Um, several uh, shots 
ng uh, from, from the uh, from the uh, from the Google Earth would indicate yung pagbabago ng landscape and also nung sa uh, forest cover in Buyog watershed from 2003, 2004, 2006, 2009, 2011, 13, 14, 17, 2022. So makikita nyo na parang nag improve naman yung remaining uh, patch ng Buyog watershed kasi from original na parang hindi pa ga gaano dense yung forest cover uh, and then to date ay mas dense na yung kanyang forest cover but uh, what we would like to highlight here is the quality of the remaining watershed so when we talk of the quality we talk about the composition of the plants and uh, animals within the area are these native species or are these introduced species or are these even invasive species so from uh, almost 20 hectares na size ng uh, buyog watershed we only have about uh, 7.92 or less than 8 hectares of the remaining forest cover and again that is an alarming uh, situation now, uh, based on our assessment, we found out that uh, the Boyog watershed falls under the category of a tropical lower mountain forest from early to old second uh, growth. So, ibig sabihin, parang may mga bagong composition na dyan ng mga species as a result of reforestation efforts. Nabanggit na kanina ni Mang Claire na nagkaroon ng joint effort ang iba't ibang mga agencies in order to uh, conduct a reforestation effort in Buyog watershed. And um, with our with the research that we have conducted, we were able to find out that there are still remaining 31 plant species and the canopy species are composed of the Benguet pine or the Pinus casea, aguho or the Casuarina equisetifolia and uh, eucalyptus camaldulensi. Kamal Kamaldolensis. And there are also understory species. So ib ibig sabihin ng mga canopy species, ito yung matataas na mga puno. And then beneath this canopy species are the understory species that are composed of Caliandra, Spathodea, Sijung, Guahaba, or yung ating Bayabas. And then uh, the bamboo belonging to the genus Bambusa. And then uh, yung Tithonia diversifolia or ito yung tinatawag natin na sunflower. And then uh, Mala, Malva viscous, Miscanthus, ito yung Bangbansit, the Lantana camera, then Brugmansia, and uh, Dendroclamus. And uh, what is shown here in this picture are some of the native plants that are still found in Buyong watershed. And uh, it's quite alarming that uh, some of these understory species and some of them are already forming canopies kasi nakikipag-compete na sila in terms of height of the, uh, the pine trees. And this would include the Spathodea campanulata or the African tulip. And then we also have this Caliandra, uh, Calotherosus, and the Lantana camera, which also forms thickets uh, in Buyog watershed. Now, these three species are already considered globally as invasive alien species or the ayas. Now, meron kasi sila mga characteristics that would, um, that, that would facilitate yung kanilang spread. So, kahit na originally ay itinanim mo lang sila sa isang area, through time, makikita mo na nag spread na sila in the uh, interior of the forest because they uh, have this... Uh, uh, wing seeds and very light yung kanilang mga seeds so they are easily dispersed through wind and um, ang bilis din nilang tumubo dahil wala silang mga original na competitors walang mga uh, original na parasites that can regulate their population kaya ang bilis nilang dumami and uh, what is alarming about this invasive alien species is that they have this uh, tendency to displace our native plants and uh, since they, these are introduced in the area, 
our local fauna do not recognize them. Kaya hindi siya nakakapag-attract ng mga local fauna. Kaya it can uh, really affect the composition of both the plants and animals within the area. So kahit na nagkaroon ng thicker forest cover or thicker vegetation but the quality of the vegetation can also have an impact on quality of the biodiversity. In terms of the avifaunal composition uh, conducted by the team of Dr. Floresca, so they were able to um, document 18 species uh, both observed and recorded that belong to 18 families. Two of these uh, species of birds belong to the threatened category. One is vulnerable, which means that, which means that uh, they, are, uh, they, they are vulnerable to extinction. And the other is uh, categorized as a threatened. So ibig sabihin ko, konti na lang yung remaining na population nila, yung individuals within that population. There are some migrants. Uh, two of these are rare migrant uh, birds, and one is fairly common. And uh, it's interesting that there are still four endemics of Luzon. The Luzon sunbird, the silver-billed nuthatch, the Philippine bush warbler, and the greenbacker whistler. The rest are already considered as residents or parang namamahay na sila, namamahay na sila sa area na yan. And they are assessed as least concern or other wildlife species based on the um, IUCN and uh, PPCC. So these are some of the pictures of the birds that we were able to document. And um, since we conducted um, inventory, or assessment in different stations. So this just shows the avifaunal composition within the Buyog Watershed Forest Reserve. And then uh, in terms of the herpetofauna composition, the team was able to uh, document one species of snake observed and recorded during the herping from 7 to 9 p.m. last November 24th. So ito yung kanyang picture. And uh, this was identified as oxyrabdium. Leporinum uh, or the Gunther's Philippine shrub snake. And um, the, uh, it, this um, snake is endemic. And uh, it's although it's a least concern or uh, listed as other wild uh, species. But uh, we were also able to hear, um, but they were not ident identified because parang rip voice, uh, ano lang non-visual accounts lang of this species of frogs, skinks, lizards. And uh, so it's difficult to identify uh, based lang on the, the, the non-visual accounts. But they are still found in the area. They, they are still uh, extant or living because they are uh, heard in the area during our visit. And so uh, you can see here na medyo kahit na maliit na lang, kahit na less than 8 hectares na lang yung remaining forested area is still rich in terms of biodiversity. Now for the mammalian composition, uh, there were only 8 individuals of uh, the Ratus tanizomi or the Asian house rat that was caught through the live trapping method. But um, we were not able to catch any bats uh, even if we installed uh, mist nets. The Ratus tanizomi um, is considered to be an intro, uh, parang, parang, parang pest na sila. And so this, it, these are also the ones that are commonly found in, in the residences kasi tinatawag nga sila na house rat. Kaya malaki pa yung kanilang population. So they are of least concern. Now, the presence of uh, Ratus tanizomi in a forested area is an indication that the place is already disturbed. Now, in terms of the land snail composition, um, and this was based on the thesis that was conducted by uh, Ms. Cotello and her uh, group mates when they conducted um, snail in the city, so ganun yung title ng kanilang thesis, snail in the city. So they were able to find uh, 13 species belonging to nine families of land snails. So we have here 
uh, the 13 species under the nine families. But um, you can also see here the quality of the species composition. Three of these are introduced, Dalopeias gracile, Delicatina folica, and the Macroclamis kelantanensis. And uh, one of these three species, the Delicatina folica, is already considered to be invasive. When we had our visit last November 2022, uh, we were able to find uh, this Lisakatina fulica. This is also known as the Biruroco in Ilocano. I'm not sure if uh, you are all familiar with this. But these African giant snails are also introduced here by the Japanese uh, when they invaded the Philippines. They um, brought this with them to say, it was used as a food source for them. Ay uh, yung parang kaparehas din nito na gina sa sa Europe na popular is the escargot helix yon magkaibang genus naman. But this one is Lisa Katina or the Biruruko. And what is uh, what makes this uh, species invasive is because of their high reproductive rate. As you can see here. Here, they are copulating, but they are hermaphroditic or present yung male and female organs in one individual. Kaya reciprocal yung kanilang uh, pag-fertilize. So when we say reciprocal, yung sperm from one individual is also transferred to the other copulating individual. Kaya pareha sila na magbubuntis uh, with this uh, copulation. And so you can just imagine na it, both of them can also produce or lay the eggs. Ito yung mga eggs nila are yellow in color. Kaya malalaman mo kung uh, galing ito sa species na to, yung color, because of the color of the eggs. So this is quite alarming kasi this uh, invasive species can also displace our local or native snails. So while there are only three that are introduced, um, Karamihan nitong mga native uh, species natin are already uh, found, but they are most of them are already dead, as you can see in the next slides. So uh, this picture only shows the um, the morphology or kung ano yung ng mga snails na sinasabi ko sa inyo. Ito yung Alopias gracile, which is also an introduced species. And uh, this one is the Macroclamis kelantanensis, which is also an introduced. This one is the Lisakatina, pero this is a juvenile stage. Yung pinakita ko sa inyo in the previous slide is the adult stage. So um, the overall condition of all the gathered uh, terrestrial snails um, is quite alarming because uh, majority of them, 61% of all the collected uh, land snails are already composed of damaged shells. So ibig sabihin, it's an indicator na matagal na silang patay kasi damaged na yung mga shells nila. And uh, about 39% are also dead but the shells are still in good condition. Ibig sabihin, mas recent pa lang silang namatay. But if you are going to add uh, parang 61 plus 39, so almost more than 90% are already dead when we collected them on the field. And uh, only 0.5% uh, was found living among all the shells that we have collected. So out of 189, parang isa or uh, very few lang talaga yung nakita namin na buhay. And again, that's an indication that the, uh, the forest reserve is already highly disturbed. Now, through a rapid assessment, so we were also able to sample the arthropod, and uh, we were able to um, document about 24 um, species of, uh, of the arthropods, arthropods would include yung mga beetles, mga langaw, and then yung mga uh, bees. Um, th there are also some um, spiders. So yun yung mga nakolekta namin in, in terms of uh, the arthropod, the arth the, the arthropod composition. Now some of these arthropods are plant associated because they are 
uh, plant eaters. So they feed on uh, the plants, thus they are termed as herbivores. And um, some of these arthropods can become pests, but um, they are also important in terms of uh, regulating the plant populations. And these are composed of the leaf hoppers, the plant hoppers, and beetles. Some of the arthropods are also important as pollinators. So they're important in crop production and in propagation of other plants. And so dito na naman pumapasok yung uh, quality ng mga species that are found in the area. Because uh, if the area is already um, dominated by the introduced or the invasive species, these uh, pollinators pollinators can also aid in the dispersal of these invasive plants. Kaya that's one reason kung bakit dumadami din yung uh, or bumibilis yung pag-spread ng ating mga invasive plants. And uh, some of these arthropods are also important uh, uh, regulators because they can also feed on smaller insects uh, and they can be considered as pest biocontrols. So ito yung mga examples ng mga predatory na invertebrates. This would also include the scorpions, the beetles, and then the earwigs, and uh, we also have the centipedes. And um, another um, parang composition ng mga arthropods are considered as decomposers. And uh, these are important in the cycling of the nutrients in the environment. And some are also serve as bioindicators. For instance, the abundance of flies would indicate a high organic population because the Buyog watershed is already surrounded by, uh, by residences. Kaya yung mga tinatapon nila na uh, waste, for example, in their backyard, nag attract yan ng mga flies. And so the presence of flies in, in the Buyog watershed is an indicator of high organic pollution. Now, uh, in terms of, uh, by, by analyzing all of these uh, results, so um, we can say that um, there's still a rich floristic composition in Buyog watershed, and that, um, the, but the understory vegetation is already dominated by non-native species, which uh, include the lantana camera or the bangbang seed, and uh, also yung mga kaliandra. And uh, these are considered to be invasive alien species. So that is something that we really need to look into on how we can uh, actually mitigate the spread of these invasive species. Now, in terms of the faunal data, um, we were able to still find um, 24 species of arthropods, uh, one species of herpetofauna, and uh, one species of rats. Um, and then several species of birds. But um, of course, there is, a, there is also a need to conduct another inventory na parang papalawakin pa yung time kasi medyo limited lang yung time span namin when we conducted this uh, biodiversity assessment. And then the, the, um, the variety of insects uh, are only possible with rich flora supporting it. Kaya it's important that we consider the kind of plants that uh, we plant in the, in the remaining green spaces so that we can still attract the native fauna. Kasi facilitators ang ating mga plants. So kung ano yung uh, magiging quality ng soil, yung quality ng vegetation, can also uh, enhance yung quality ng mga animals that can be recruited in these remaining green spaces. Now for the terrestrial snails, uh, since uh, these are considered to be indicator species kasi the abundance of uh, live uh, snails would indicate a good quality of the green space. Pero kung mas marami ng patay, that is an indicator of a highly disturbed uh, forest patch. And um, the use of native plants, specifically the fruit bearing and water retained species should be considered when we conduct a restoration effort in Buyog Watershed or uh, Buyog Water Forest Reserve in order to enhance 
the ecosystem services that was already mentioned earlier by Ma'am Claire. And uh, para may increase din natin yung mga uh, migratory uh, birds and uh, kasi ang, ang Baguio City is one of the um, bird spots. So dinadayo to ng mga birders uh, particularly sa Camp Chan Hay. Kaya again, the quality of the vegetation can enhance the diversity of the birds. And then the calling of I identified and potential um, invasive alien species is also recommended in order to eliminate or at least minimize the threats of bio invasion. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. And uh, we hope that uh, through knowledge, we can become part of the solution. Thank you and good afternoon. Thank you very much. <laughs> Professor Seni Bawanan. Okay, now we are ready for the question and answer. So I have here several. And uh, the first one is addressed to uh, si Ma'am ano, si Ma Claire. So the first one is, kasama sa fauna, sa urban ang mga daga, ipis, lamok, stray animals, etc. What to do with them? Or part na sila ng urban ecosystem? And the question is, you can answer this also, Ma'am Claire, but I also invite Professor Sandy Bawana to answer this because the third question is also related. Bakit po pinapayagan ng LGU or whoever na kumapal ang mga tao dyan sa Buyok Watershed? Hindi po kaya dapat yung original na Buyog watershed, the one uh, in red, you know, yung red line, uh, hindi na payagang maglagay ng mga human built structure. So yes, Ma'am Claire, and then uh, Ma'am Zen. Yes, okay. So for the first question, yes, they're actually part of uh, of our urban biodiversity already. Etong mga domesticated looking at buyog specifically, ang ang ano na eh, talagang very near na kasi yung residential areas doon sa sa forest natin. So uh, in our in our um uh planning management planning uh, sa next next activity for Buyug watershed will be the management planning for the conservation of the biodiversity we have to address eto mga stray dogs and the rats na pumapasok doon yung mga domesticated kasi dapat wildlife talaga ang nandun sa forest natin so yun ang isang i-address natin sa management uh, conservation management plan natin Yung, um, yung mga stray animals and the domesticated animals that are entering the uh, forest. And, the and for the, and the second question, <laughs> medyo mahirap yung second question na yan. And that is the reason why we are we have this MOA for all stakeholders. Kasi for, for DNR, we... Um, um, you would notice a uh, presentation ni Ma'am uh, Zen na there was a MOA or there was the management of the Buyug watershed was detailed or was uh, uh, the responsibility was given to the LGU, CT, LGU, the DNR, and the Bawadi. So, um, um, ayun, yung, um, we could call them squatters where, where, um, uncontrollable at that time siguro and we were not able to control the residential areas booming the population booming within the within the fences and even beyond the fences of the buyug watershed so yun din yun din ang um, kaya ito stake uh, multi stakeholder process that will go through through a lot of uh, uh, discussions and uh, collaborations to address this <laughs> Maybe Mam Zen will add to that. Yes, have, uh, and then I have a follow-up question since yes, uh, uh, also here now. So hindi so yung pangalawa po hindi po kaya dapat yung original line. And then um, another question is I'm wondering how the water quality is preserved considering that kind of urban sprawl. Now that you tell us that the, the high pop that Baguio City has a very 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 high population density far from what it was uh, supposed to be. Yes, talagang nakakaroon na tayo ng water insecurity kasi uh, because of the dwindling, uh, dwind dwindling size of the remaining watersheds. So uh, nabanggit nga kanina ni Ma'am uh, Ma Claire na um, this is a very 
parang very difficult uh, problem to address kasi it would really entail uh, multi-stakeholders eh, uh, starting from the uh, government or the local government unit going going down to the residents. Kasi siyempre if you are residing in that area, ipaglalaban mo talaga yan, di ba? Makikipagpatayan ka just to secure yung area na yan. Kasi in the first place nga parang naging problem yan kung bakit sila na, nabigyan ng uh, ng water line, bakit sila nabigyan ng mga electricity line, something like that. Eh, kaya talagang malaking problema siya. And uh, I think what can the immediate uh, uh, solution is to protect the the remaining the remaining green spaces and to improve the quality of the remaining spaces now to increase the remaining green green spaces yan na talaga kailangan ng uh, joint effort from the local government unit and then uh, some of these are even um, ano na uh, owned by private uh, entities na Uh, so again, our law uh, cannot do anything. Pagka private properties na, di ba, Ma'am Claire? Mm -hmm. Kaya uh, ang mga nagiging nakikita na part of the solution would be to incentivize uh, the private owners to um, improve uh, their uh, land ownership by improving the quality of the green spaces uh, na privately owned. So these are some of the things that are um, that that can be a part of the solution in this uh, growing problem of uh, insecurity in terms of the remaining land and water source. Okay, um, I have a question actually for Professor Seni Bawanan because there was a nationwide call, I think, in the United States to involve the regular citizens in killing lantern flies because they are invasive species. In the case of uh, Baguio City, um, do we have any such um, need to call upon the ordinary citizens to help with mitigating the spread of invasive alien species, especially the floral one? Because I myself am very attracted to lantana and all those, you know, really nice looking mm -hmm. plants. I, I, I had no idea they are invasive. African tulip. <laughs> um, yeah. Should, should there be a call like that? Uh, um, currently, kasi meron kaming uh, project and that is on the African tulip. Uh, hindi, hindi pa lang kasi namin natatapos yung uh, report na yan. But uh, we are already coordinating with the CEPMO, the City Environment and Parks Management Office. And they're already starting to actually regulate the population. Yung mga maliliit pa lang ng mga uh, African tulips o kaya yung mga um, kaliandra, baka pwede nang i-uproot. Uh, kasi pag pinabayaan mo sila na magiging adult pa yung mga yan, mag-add uh, mag up pa sila doon sa pag-spread nitong mga uh, invasive species na to. Uh, for, for some plants naman that are considered to be introduced or exotic, uh, okay lang naman na parang mag-stay pa rin sila dyan kasi hindi naman sila nag spread Ang problema lang talaga yung mga invasive, yung kahit hayaan mo lang sila dyan eh, sila na mismo nagdi-disperse on their own. So yun yung mga kailangan nating uh, i-regulate. Um, we, through, uh, siguro through campaigns sa mga local residents, uh, huwag na sila magtatanim ng mga, mga ganyan, mga potential na invasive species. At palitan na lang nila ng mga native plants. We have a lot of uh, in, uh, native plants. And in fact, the uh, UP campus, we have this uh, native plant committee. And we are also trying to popularize yung mga native plants para yun na lang yung itatanim natin sa backyard. And uh, sila na yung dadami. So that's one of our Thank advocacy. You. Yeah. Thank you. Thank and then, um, Mom Claire, I have another question for you. So you've been with DNR for 30 years. <laughs> I'm sure you've observed a lot of changes. Mm -hmm. But what major negative change in uh, Baguio's uh, biodiversity have you seen that uh, you now think is irreversible? And what is reversible? Para naman hopeful din tayo. Mm, and ayun. I would ask the same question from Ma'am Zeni naman as a scholar here in UP Baguio in almost, you know, for almost 30 years, what have you seen as changes that are uh, sadly irreversible and ones that, you know, we can still hope to see within our lifetime are changed or reversed? 
Ayun, so um, um, ang nakikita ko sa Baguio, I have observed through the years, is yung land use change from forest and green spaces to infrastructure and buildings and resorts. So ayun, um, particularly that Baguio has become a tourist destination, ang dami ng, uh, we are sacrificing the green spaces in Baguio. So um, with this program, we hope, we hope, to we hope to um, uh, limit limit the uh, land use change in Baguio City to conserve and preserve our forests and um, wetlands also. If we have wetlands, our rivers and creeks and even Burnham Lake, um, they are so uh, uh, they are needed for the mitigation of climate change. So yan po yun yung ano um, irreversible <laughs> the the Baguio community is so they are so um ano uh, ano na yon nakikita nila talaga yung changes eh kaya there are there are protests uh, every time everywhere kasi nakikita nila the changes that are that are happening and um, that are harming our our ecosystems in Baguio. So hopefully, uh, how how to mitigate these uh, uh, changes in land use, yun sana ang um, kailangan na iplano. <laughs> May land use plan naman na ang Baguio, comprehensive land use plan. So yun siguro, um, as uh, stakeholders, we will we will all uh, help in the in the preparation of the conservation plan. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, okay. I agree with uh, the observations of uh, Ma'am Claire. So um, when we talk of reversible and irreversible, um, if we will look at a larger scale, so something na irreversible would be the carbon dioxide composition of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere that is already uh, leading to global warming and also the change in the weather condition yung mga extreme uh, extreme weather conditions na na-experience natin ngayon, parang irreversible na yan. Kasi sabi nga nila, kahit magtanim na magtanim ka pa ng maraming halaman, parang ang hirap nang mag-catch up doon sa original na ano natin, na, na level ng uh, carbon dioxide, na ma-reduce ang car carbon dioxide. So parang yun, that is something that uh, is parang alarming because it's uh, it's already uh, irreversible kasi kailangan talaga global effort ang gagawin in order to uh, reverse the condition kaya that's a it's a huge task di ba now uh, in terms of the composition of plants this is something that can that can be reversed okay so it's it's reversible pa kasi we can be proactive eh. we can be engaged in changing the the quality or the kind of plants that we are uh, in that we are planting in our uh, in the city kaya pwede pa nating uh, sabihin na with a massive campaign and with the help of the uh, netizen those that uh, are um, that are engaged in uh, in the in the quality of the plants that they, they would want to uh, in, in to uh, put in their backyard so ito reversible pa to okay kaya um, yun lang naman ang aking opinion and in terms of the built up areas again uh medyo kailangan ng political will kasi where are you going to place them so, Iba sa kanila, titled na. So how are you going to uh, look into this? Kailangan natin ng mga social scientists to also help in uh, resolving all of these problems. Okay. Thank you very much for those answers and for sharing your the results of your study. No, this is um, one of those things that really uh, showcase what uh, multi-stakeholder, you know, co um, collaboration between government agencies and the academe and the students and the researchers and other um, stakeholders can really do to solve problems that we all will be impacted by. So 
on behalf of all the audience here who have stayed with us the whole time. Nobody left. Thank you very much. Although we extended a few for a few minutes, uh, we would like to thank our speakers again, Simon Binda, Claire Powitz, the Professor Sinaida Bawanan. And I would just like to read quickly the certificate that uh, is virtually given to you with, uh, um, with of course, a lot of thanks. Uh, this is a certificate of appreciation hereby awarded to Linda Claire Powid, Professor Sinaida G. Bawanan uh, for sharing invaluable findings and insights from their research work during the 114th celebration of Baguio Charter Day held jointly by the College of Social Sciences and the College of Science on 12 September 2023. Signed by Assistant Professor Fran Shoshi, Chairperson of the CSS Lecture Series, and Dr. Leia Abayao, Dean of the College of Social Sciences. Again, we would like to um, congratulate you on your study. And of course, thank you very, very much for that enlightening afternoon of photos and you know flora and fauna and all the other interesting insights from you. So thank you. And uh, to all our participants, please do not forget to give us some feedback by answering the survey form. So thank you and again good afternoon. Thank, thank you. you Bye. <laughs> Bye. Bye.